Let's start with Jim Milano on the end. Jim Milano is partner with the law firm of Wiener Brodsky Kiter, based in Washington, D.C. Jim represents and advises mortgage and finance companies on issues such as, in the lengthy list here, responding to federal and state regulatory audits and enforcement actions, state regulatory approvals, lending and servicing programs, state laws and regulations concerning loan disclosures, allowable fees, servicing, and prohibited practices, federal laws and regulations including, but not limited to, all these acronyms, TILA, RESPA, ECOA, FDCPA, HUMDA, FCRA, Graham Leach Wiley or GLBA, and uh, the implementation of Dodd-Frank Act and CFPB regulations. So he knows all the acronyms. <laughs> We're making up more. Yeah, it doesn't stop. Uh, Jim also represents investors and sellers in the acquisition and sale of mortgage and finance companies and consumer finance and mortgage assets. Jim is nationally recognized as one of the leading lawyers in the area of reverse mortgage law. Please welcome Jim. Okay, next to him is uh, Kerry Imani, uh, Vice President, Training and Support at QuestSoft. Kerry manages the support and multimedia training for more than 2,600 QuestSoft customers nationwide. His extensive financial services and training background, forward thinking and attention to detail, bring high value to QuestSoft and fuel his team earning continued client loyalty and testimonials on stellar customer service. Kerry has served on, in key roles in the financial services industry since 1981 and with QuestSoft since 2004. Before joining QuestSoft, uh, he held several leadership positions for 13 years at Harlan Financial Solutions, helping the company grow from 50 employees to over 5,000. He has trained financial institutions in all 50 states on regulatory compliance and lectured nationwide on financial industry and new legislation and changing trends. Kerry has offered uh, several important articles on compliance and training methodology and is a member of the American so Society of Training and Development. Please welcome Kerry to our panel. <laughs> Next to him, Justin Kirsch. I got that right. Got it. <laughs> Justin Kirsch is the founder and president of Access Business Technologies, ABT, a leading provider of mortgage technology and security solutions. He also scared the daylights out of me with some stuff that he's going to show you, so stay tuned. Got me a little bit freaked out about security. Uh, it's so. okay. It's all the water's warm. Jump in. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So... Um, Prior to starting ABT in 2001, Justin was the Chief Technology Officer at uh, Security National. He led a team of 80 professionals to build out the technology infrastructure for over 60 mortgage subsidiaries, processing billions in mortgage loans annually. The large majority of Justin's career has been solely rooted in the mortgage industry, and he has become one of the foremost authorities in the mortgage technology and fintech security space. Justin knows that when we provide a safe, compliant, and reliable cloud workspace for mortgage professionals, they thrive. He and the rest of the team at ABT pride themselves on listening to customers well, collecting their feedback, and actively improving products to keep solutions current and relevant to help our clients stay competitive. Justin has also earned an MBA with a master's degree in management information science and a bachelor's degree in business administration. Please welcome Justin. And lastly, we have Jim Wagner. He's with us, Reverse Vision. He's the Chief Technology Officer at Reverse Vision. He has over 20 years of experience as a technology leader delivering high quality technology solutions, systems, and products for lifestyle resort, travel, banking, security, and automated verticals. Prior to joining Reverse Vision as Chief Technology Officer, Jim was President and Chief Operations, Operating Officer for Ituri Court a market leader in mobile parental control software. Previously, Jim led a series of acclaimed contributions to world-class corporations such as MyTech Systems, Symantec, MGM Mirage Resorts, and Wynn, who's been in the news today, <laughs> Encore Las Vegas. Outside of the office, Jim composes and produces electronic music in his home studio and enjoys surfing and snowboarding whenever possible. Please welcome Jim. 
All right, so we've already established that each of these guys is an expert in their specific area of compliance and or security. We all understand the importance of compliance in our industry. And as more things move into the technology realm, security has also become an important focus for, for us as well. These guys are here to talk about how to keep your business secure, compliant with Ox, changes in the industry, Humda, and more. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Jim, we're going to start with you. Uh, let's talk about vendor audits. Okay. Um, obviously, IT security and compliance are big topics, so we're going to break it into chunks. We'll start with vendor audits. Um, that's one of the most digestible ones that we can talk about because we can do that here at Reverse Vision. And uh, as most of you know, back with the housing meltdown, things like TRID, your responsibility as a company to make sure you're doing your due diligence uh, with your vendor, or in the case of us, Reverse Vision, it's entirely your responsibility. Jim's going to explain this to us. So Jim, let's start with what are vendor audits and why are they needed? All right, so vendor audits, uh, periodic vendor audits, are part of the lender's uh, responsibility to make sure that their vendors that provide services uh, are compliant and uh, uh, have risk management profiles that, uh, that work for your organization. Uh, the OCC, CFPB, and uh, Division of Banking Supervision and Regulation all have set down guidelines as far as uh, what these audits should be and vendor management in general. Uh, we understand that, uh, that it's vital for you guys to stay uh, uh, current with our risk assessment and uh, uh, as such, uh, things such as uh, our industry compliance with regulations, legal history, the health of the business, and uh, our uh, information security processes are all up to date. Uh, aside from just the regulatory part of it, we're eager to ensure your compliance departments that, uh, that we adhere to all these things. We're ready. Okay, where is this information available and what is a base package? Okay, so the information is available at support.reversevision.com. Uh, it's self-service. Uh, you can go through the portal and you download a package. The base package consists of um, information about the principles, our business license, our information security and uh, insurance policies, business continuity plan, and uh, our service operator controls as we host some infrastructure with Rackspace, uh, who provides that documentation as part of the package. Okay. Uh, one more question. What other documents come up in the requests? Okay, oftentimes we get a uh, checklist uh, that go through a variety of different uh, controls and processes and our maturity to manage those things within our organization. Um, some of them are very quick uh, to answer, others become more involved and can take more time. And the custom ones uh, that are put together uh, can be quite uh, time consuming and we've even considered in the future maybe turning those into a professional service. Is there anything else you want to tell us about uh, vendor audits? That's, that's, it. that's pretty much it. Does anyone have any questions regarding vendor audits before we move on? <coughs> any questions on mm -hmm. vendor? Yes. So as part of the New York uh, cybersecurity certifications uh, that are already in place and the vendor assessments that we have to look at in the next nine months, um, I, I, I'm assuming that you've already looked into some of those requirements and a little bit for that? I mean, penetration tests and whatnot? Yeah, we run regular penetration tests. And uh, we also know that uh, two-factor off is, uh, is huge, and uh, we're preparing a release that has that in it. Yes? That's a good question. Uh, a variety of things can cause uh, a review. Uh, one of them, it could be annual or semi-annual. Another one could be a regulations change that, uh, that uh, the lending organization wants to make sure that if they're going under review that, uh, that we've accommodated for that sort of thing and we have uh, that document. Another one is any material change in our business. 
other questions on vendor audits before we move on? Only once? Only twice? All right, moving on. We're going to talk to Justin Kirsch, and we're going to talk about online security. Let me kind of set this up for a second, and then we're going to let you uh, show us some security details. This leads us into security at a whole other level from a global perspective. In line with vendor audits comes overall online security and compliance requirements to protect from security breaches. Of course, we've heard about these in the news quite frequently, especially lately. Justin's company focuses on protecting mortgage companies while still allowing for them to be mobile and productive. The first question I have for you, Justin, is who's trying to hack us? Who are these people? What do they look like? Um, <clears throat> they're not what you would typically think of. It's not a hacker in a basement or a teenager um, or even a, a super smart person who's trying to figure out how to reverse engineer code and get into the back of a system. Um, the bulk of hacks that end up with, with a data breach, and we'll, we'll go through some statistics, are, are really coming from phishing attacks. About 91% of them start with phishing attacks. And the folks that are doing them um, are really more like your marketing team than they are um, like a hacking team. And they're trying to put emails together that are going to fake you out and make you believe something that, that's not true. And they're getting better and better at how they look. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if all of you have seen that so far this year. The last two or three years, it has gotten really bad. In our um, call center, one of the number one calls that we're getting right now is helping companies um, that are in, under attack. And they're being specifically targeted, mortgage companies are. And they're, they're getting email lists of every loan officer in the company and sending them phishing attacks trying to get them to click on links and give up their passwords. And the better they are at these phishing marketing campaigns, the more likely they are to get a username and password, and then they don't even need to be a sophisticated hacker. They just log straight into your system, get the data that they want. Well, and that leads us to the next question. What do they want? What are they looking for? So <clears throat> most all of these, they're really financially motivated. Um, and so that's ultimately what they want to do is figure out how to make money on this. If it's just steal data and sell it on the black market, or even more sophisticated operations will even try to um, get folks to wire money, or even um, at your wiring desk try to get involved in that and reroute funds. Um, but ultimately, they want the non-public information, um, and as much of it as they can get, they can either sell it or they can prey on your clients at stealing their identity and um, get, ultimately getting their money, taking out loans in their name, doing various different things. Uh, next question is, of course, because my reaction was, well, I haven't seen any mortgage companies in the news, so it's probably not as frequent. And of course, that leads us to the question, are there new risks in the mortgage industry? And how big are the risks today? So in the last two years, the hackers have figured out that Financial institutions have the most information, financial organizations, uh, non-public information that they want to get to. Of the financial organizations, mortgage companies have the most NPI or non-public information of anyone out there. When you really look at what you have, it's more than a typical bank, unless they're doing a mortgage. It's, it's more than your accountant uh, has. You have more information that can help them steal their identity. So mortgage companies are being specifically targeted, but they're also being targeted, even small mortgage companies, because they have the least sophisticated security in place, um, given the amount of information that they have. So it's something we really need to, to change. So you're telling me the risks are pretty big. They're huge. Yeah. Anybody scared yet? <laughs> uh, so this seems very overwhelming. Uh, the question is, how can businesses and people protect themselves? So. Um, what, what maybe I'll do is take a quick minute to kind of go over a few statistics that can kind of bring everybody up to speed. I, I actually put out a, um, a paper every year, the top um, cybersecurity facts and figures um, for the mortgage industry. Specifically for it, you can stop by our booth and, and take a look or get a copy of it if you would like. But so, all of these stats that I'm going to go over are, are going to... Um, be on that sheet and, and some information that, that could help you. But um, 
If you look between the cyber attacks that happened last year and this year, they've doubled. But that's been a trend that has happened every year for the last five years. So it's getting worse and worse every year, and it's something that you are probably starting to experience more and more now with phishing attacks. Um, if we could switch over to the slide, I'm going to kind of walk you through um, some history here, and we're going to start at the top. So this is a great website that I love called Information is Beautiful, and it shows bubbles of um, We're not there yet. Reaches. Oh, you guys can't see it yet. Okay. Okay. No problem. No problem. Uh, this is the one up there. What you're going to see in a second is the world's biggest data breaches by year. And it's going to scroll down the year, and there's going to be these big bubbles. And they're going to be different colors. Red is, is bad. And the larger the bubble, the worse the breach was. And I'm going to kind of walk you through time and show you um, how, how bad things have actually gotten just in the last 10 years. And there's a link on the handout that I have that will actually show you as well. There we go. Beautiful. All right. So this is 2017. And you can see the one we all care about, which was Equifax um, right here. And you can see the red is they were actually hacked. Um, and then it kind of goes down all the different reasons, accidentally published, hacked. Um, but the how bad the data is, the bigger the bubble, the more records that were stolen. And as you look down off to the left here, you can see 2017, and then as I scroll down, kind of watch 2016, 2015, 2014, and now it all started getting really bad in about 2008. And, and then it just kind of blew. The last, the last few years, You've, you've just seen a doubling to where these bubbles don't really even show up anymore on this. And, it, and it's pretty scary. So um, if, if uh, there's a, an interesting quote from, from Warren Buffett. He took it pretty seriously. And he said that it is the number one problem with humankind. And it was, I, when I first read that, I was like, really? Even over nuclear or, you know, weapons or something like that? And he responded to somebody who actually said that to him in a question. He said, yes, because he didn't think that was very likely. But this is not just likely. It's happening right now. And really, we are all at war. And we are sitting back not even realizing that we are at war. And so what I thought I would kind of show you is this graphic of uh, real-time cyber attacks that are actually happening right now. And, and so this is, it's showing you from different countries that are coming over to the US, some are happening from the US and back over, and this is actually real time. And so people are resisting putting on their seatbelts. Remember when seatbelts first became you know, a, a law and we had to wear them, there was a whole bunch of people who resisted seatbelts. Well, the equivalent to the seatbelt in cybersecurity is two-factor authentication. And so now I, I hope, now as I'm saying two-factor, you don't think, well, that sounds complicated. What is it? It was described up here a couple of times um, and just mentioned before. It's really pretty simple. And it's gotten really easy to do. It's as easy as putting your seatbelt on. But the, the, the programs and the software have to have it. But it is probably the single biggest thing that you can do is all of your software needs to have multi-factor authentication also called two-factor authentication. And, and there are new programs that are out right now that make this super easy. And you can actually have your iPhone, and you, 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 you're at your website, you type in your username and password, and what happens is the program pauses, and it says, well, wait a minute, I, you, you have the username and password, but I'm not really sure I know who you are. And then if you have your phone with you, up pops this little program that says, hey, someone's trying to get into your, your web program. Is that OK? And you hit the approve button. There's no even entering codes. That's how easy it is. 
and, and the tools are getting better and better, but they're being really resisted. People don't like change. And so I'm in the middle of rolling them out for several large mortgage companies right now, and even the top executives resist this sort of a change, but it is the single biggest thing that you can do to protect yourself. The second one is modernize your IT infrastructure. and uh, Get to the cloud. The cloud is actually safer than, than having those servers in your closet um, that are outdated and not being updated and probably not being run by, by date like they're supposed to. Get to the cloud. Let that all happen for you automatically. Um, and get what, what um, I like to call a, an email guardian over your email because phishing attacks come fast and furious. And the single biggest thing you can do is every URL that comes into your email ought to be rewritten and redirects the employee when they click that link to a different website that checks that URL out and says, <coughs> is that a good one or is, is that a known problem? And then lets it through or doesn't let it through. Those two things are probably the biggest thing you can do. Well, great question and great answer. Anybody else have a question? Yeah, I have a question. So uh, how often do you, do you recommend to run phishing tests internally? And if so, how often? Um, I recommend getting those two things in place first. Those are the biggest things you're going to do because I, I've been running these tests and I, I recommend that you run them on a regular basis and they're great. Um, there's some good companies out there that we partner with that, that do a good job at doing them. Um, but they they work for the people who are already paying attention, but the people that aren't paying attention, they're ignoring them and failing and not, not doing a good job. So you know who they are, but we really got to stop it from happening in the first place. So, so education is important, but they're getting so good, it's hard to tell what's real and what's not real. The best way to do it is to get into a system that multiple mortgage companies are using, and they're feeding information into it about attacks that are happening in real time, and we're all benefiting from that, so that when your link is clicked, it won't let you through if somebody else has already figured out it's bad. Um, where's the other? Yes. Oh, I have the yeah. Um, right. So you mentioned the, the two, what you call, not two tiers. Multi-factor authentication, or you'll, you'll hear techies calling it multi-factor <coughs> authentication because there really are, you can do a lot of different ways, but, but I like to talk about it as two-factor, two because that's really all you need to, to get the protection. And two quick questions. So I use Calix Point for forward. Do they have that system in place that you know of? <laughs> so a lot of the software companies are behind in doing this, but that does not mean you can't do it other ways. Okay, so the short answer is no. <laughs> I don't hear him say that. that. I didn't ask if we use reverse vision, do they have that in place? Yeah. Yes, I've heard that they do. It will be in place beginning in March. Fantastic, thank you. Right. Yep. And, then, and then, so if we, so Calix does not have it. What's the easiest way for just a, a mom and pop shop to, to do that. Um, so the safest thing that you can do from a, a security standpoint is run off what are called virtual desktops. And and what you can do is you can put another 259. I mean, who's going to be effectively, you know, in the position of being able to back that sort of commitment, that sort of funding commitment? And Lehman figured out a way to do it with the cash account and their securitizations. There was a lot of work that went into that. But, you know, it's sort of the field of dreams. Build it and they will come. And the originators are like, well, we could really use this product and offer it, but we need someone to sell it to. So it's going to take someone to come in and be able to design these products and originate them, have the funding if they're not a bank, carry them, and then put them into a securitization. And I think we'll get there. I'm not sure we'll get there with a jumbo reverse ELOC this year, but I think we're going to see more uh, non hecka products um, come out this year. I'd like to see it happen. We all would, right? Okay. Um, so I mentioned that 2013, 15, 17 were loaded with major changes, mm -hmm. uh, pretty significant changes. What can we expect from HUD over the next year with regard to program changes? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, the driver's going to be, so, so basically, 
you know, um, what is a Trump Republican? You know, we have a different animal <laughs> in charge in D.C. now. We still don't have an FHA commissioner. Uh, I think we will have one uh, by March. I think it's going to be Brian Montgomery. He's going to come back. I think when he gets to his desk on his first day of work, he's going to have a lot to do. He's, there's going to be a lot of questions waiting for him. There's going to be a lot of people waiting at his door, getting, asking him to do things. For our industry, it, it really goes a few years ago. And I honestly don't understand that. You know, if I put on my common man, every man, layman, guy on the street hat and ask, how do we go from positive six billion to negative six billion from one year to the next? It just doesn't sound right. It doesn't feel right. So the first thing that has to be addressed, one of the things that has to be addressed is, is the actuarial study on the Heckman program and what was done there and whether anything in that can be looked at. There's this talk of taking the Heckam insurance out of the MMI fund. They think that that will be a solution. It might help. That has other side effects. Um, so there's that, number one. Number two, I think the real fix for the Heckam program needs to take place on the back end. So someone asked me earlier today, how long does a Heckam loan last? And from origination to assignment on average used to be seven years. But once HUD gets it, they hold it for another seven years. So what does HUD do with these loans? How do they service them? They hire a contractor. We have government contracting. No offense to anyone in the room. I'm not looking at you, Chad. <laughs> you know, it's typically lowest bidder. And I thought part of the thought process is, well, why don't we let the servicers in the business today, the master servicers who use subservicers, just continue to service the loan. And that, I think, is going to take some work to get there. That would turn all those master servicers into government contractors. The bottom line on this is, I don't think HUD does a very good job of servicing these loans. And I think that there's a lot of losses on the back end. And quite frankly, that may have changed people's views with respect to the actuarial study when HUD finally got around to looking at this and saying, holy cow, we need to change our assumptions. So, so that, I think, needs to be addressed. HUD is, does not want to make any changes to the program unless they feel like they have to uh, for this year, I think. That's what we've heard. But they're going to be watching the HECM program, and if they see more you know, weaknesses, uh, there may be more changes. I think people in industry are trying to talk to HUD and say, well, first of all, your study may not be good. Second of all, we need to figure out a way to do a better job uh, with these HECM loans that have been assigned. Uh, to you. Um, so, so we'll see. You know, beyond that, I mean, I had some statistics going back to 2000. We did have some doozies, mortgagee letters in 2014, a couple. We did. NBS, fixed rate, uh, single disbursement, uh, those came out, I believe, in 2014. Um, but since January of 2013, we've had 33 mortgagee letters in the HECA program. And that doesn't include other mortgagee letters that apply to all of single family lending, including HECMs. So that's about six or seven new mortgagee letters every year. That's a new HECM mortgagee letter every two months. Reverse mortgages are first and foremost residential mortgage loans. So in 2011, we got the Dodd-Frank Act. The Bureau came around. We had massive Bureau regulations that became effective in January 2014. Reverses have to comply with most of that, and in addition to all of that, we've got all this HECM overlay. We got new regulations that were issued on January 19, um, 2017. Why? What happened then? Why did they have to get the rule out? I'm asking you a question. It's the inauguration. The next day, January 20, Trump got sworn in, so people within HUD felt like we got to get this rule out. And when you look at the rule, half of it, you know, I'm a football guy, is a punt. They punted on so many fundamental questions that I think had they thought they had more time, I, I think they would have answered a lot of these questions. Uh, somebody asked me last night, have we gotten, have we ever gotten any good news in the heck of world? When have we gotten good news? And I didn't answer the question, but I thought about it later. 
They revised the rules on hacking for purchase and their certificate of occupancy. Jim from Stratmore talked about that this morning. Oh, you don't need a, a CO at application. It can come buyer before endorsement. But we got thrown a curveball in November. Someone from HUD got up at a meeting and said, well, no, the appraisal has to be done as completed. And for the life of me, I've dug through all sorts of FHA <laughs> literature, and I can't find that rule. You know, so uh, that sort of put a damper on what we thought was going to be a tailwind, as opposed to all the headwinds we're always facing in this industry, right? We thought that would be a tailwind on the act of a purchase, and that throws in some uncertainty. My point of this is we need more engagement and more certainty out of HUD. I think we were getting that before the Trump Republicans showed up. I think there's a lot of people at HUD, and they're very good people today. They're smart people. We don't have an FHA commissioner. I think you sort of have people trying to figure out what's going on. By the way, we had some natural disasters last year, some hurricanes, some fires. We had a few. We had a few. And that sapped up a lot of bandwidth and resources and attention at HUD right when the heck of rules were going into effect. Um, so, you know, cleaning up the back end, revisiting the actual study, getting clarification on fundamental issues like HECM for purchase. We would have liked an interpretation that all of the new servicing rules that went into effect on September 19th with the new rule, that, uh, that, that applied to all HECMs in force as of that date. That's how the CFPB servicing regulations work, right? Those rules don't apply to loans originated on or after January 2014. They apply to every loan being serviced in. Why wouldn't the same concept apply to HECM loans being serviced? And if you had that, you could have cash for keys, you know, better streamline uh, deem lose, short sales, all of the new things put into the regulation to help lessen the impact on the funds, and on the MMI fund and the claims being filed. But HUD came up with this interpretation almost near the last minute and said, no, these even the servicing aspect of these new regulations only apply to case numbers on or after September 19th. That was a curveball. Right. So, you know, we need engagement. We need someone to sort of look at the program again. We sort of, I feel like, have been sidetracked for the better part of a year with constructive colloquy, the type that we've had in years past. So, I, that was a long-winded answer saying, I don't know what's going on. I would like, I, I would like, I'd like to get back to one element that you mentioned, though. That was the certificate of occupancy. Yes. Um, that came out in an FAQ. They had the ability to send out uh, a mortgagee letter and change. Uh, yeah. They're authorized to do yeah. that, but they chose not to. And it, why did they come out with an FAQ to clarify something that seems like a regulatory change to me? Um, so I think, good question. I think what you're talking about was an FHA info. Yes, yeah, that's right. Yes. Um, and I think the focus of that bulletin dealt, was intended to deal more with the, the date of the case number assignments to deal with the pipeline. Yeah, and uh, there was this additional gloss or clarification that said, yes, yes, yes. The, the CO just needs to be in place at closing and not um, on the date of application. Right. But they were trying to clarify all the H for P that were in the pipeline. The issue of the appraisal came from the podium at the NERMA meeting in San Francisco in November. That came after the FHA info came out. Right. And I remember when the FHA info came out, Reverse Mortgage Daily uh, very quickly addressed that. But it's, it's sometimes confusing why they don't come out with regulatory change that they're authorized to do with the yeah. G letter. Yeah. So, yeah, we need more communication, better communication. Whether there's going to be any change to the HECM program by HUD in 2018 um, mainly depends on the performance, the overall performance of the program. What I'm hoping changes with respect to the communication between industry and our biggest partner, our mortgage insurance company, and our regulator of this program is, is just more constructive colloquy back and forth like we had uh, in years past. And, and that's what we need. We need someone to you know, answer these questions and listen to us and hear us out. 
you know, there's rules on appraisals for new construction in the 203B program, and they don't say what was said from the podium in San Francisco in November. It's, it's different, and we need to go in and we need someone that will engage and listen to us, and then we say, well, you know, here's what it says in the handbook about new construction. Why is it different? And just getting someone to focus on that and get an answer, that's, that's been a challenge. Since the biggest inauguration crowd in the history of the world took place <laughs> on January 20th, 2017. Yes, sir. So, so back, to, back to the audit piece of the six billion positive and the six billion negative. So I agree with you. Did they change? Do we know if they changed how they viewed the actuarial? Or do we know if they changed something? Yeah, we, we do. And I, Liz Ecker, I think you guys may have covered this in some articles in Reverse Mortgage Daily. The outfit called New View Advisors, which is Joe Kelly and Mike McCulley, they actually come out of Lehman. They're the guys that did all the cash account securitizations that I was talking about before. Um, I read their report on not 2017's actuarial study, but the one from 2016. And the two drivers was a revised assumption on home price appreciation or depreciation. That was one of the big drivers. And the other, and I don't agree with that, by the way. I mean, they, it went really negative. And one of the thoughts was, well, the homes that seniors live in, the seniors are not going to keep them up. So they're not only not going to appreciate, they're going to de depreciate even in an otherwise <coughs> favorable environment or not appreciate as quickly. That was one assumption. The other one were interest rates. And for interest rates, if somebody told me, well, you know, last year or even two years ago, interest rates are going to go up, I would have I believed that because interest rates have been artificially low for, for a very uh, long time. And the interest rate affects, I think, the discount factor that they have to use, uh, the higher the rate the words it is for the calculations for the fund. So let's uh, let's move away from HUD just for a moment, and uh, hopefully we'll have some additional time for some questions at the end. Uh, what can we expect from other agencies? For example, we've got the CFPB that is uh, a new CFPB. <coughs> it's a different CFPB. A new but um, of course, we just recently had the U.S. Court of Appeals ruling. Do you want to elaborate on that? So the PHH case, so that was the first uh, litigated administrative case that the CFPB um, took on. Um, the CFPB has a number of ways to deal with people they regulate. They can send out CIDs or subpoenas. They can examine you. Um, they could sue you in federal district court. They could sue you in their administrative law court. Um, typically, litigation is not going to occur until after they've been through an investigatory process. But in this particular case, they had submitted CID subpoenas to PHH. And this was going back and forth for a while, but PHH did not want to settle along the lines that the Bureau wanted to. So it went to administrative litigation. The interesting thing, a lot of inside baseball here, but it's public information. The CFPB did not have its administrative law judge court set up. That case was tried at the SEC, the Securities and Exchange uh, Commission, by an SEC judge who knew very little about RESPA. But it turns out he knew more than Cordray did, <laughs> in hindsight. <laughs> so real quick, his ruling was, it wasn't quite sure. The statute of limitations question was a question as to whether RESPA or eight, Section 8C2 provided a safe harbor to the anti-kickback and referral prohibition. But net, 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 his ruling was, we think PHH has some exposure here for the mortgage reinsurance business to the tune of about $6 million. In the administrative law process that the Bureau has set up, if there's a ruling at the ALJ level and that gets appealed, who does it get appealed to? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? <laughs> Mr. Cordray himself. Those cases are the appellate officer is the director of the CFPB, and Richard Cordray was the appellate hearing officer for that case, and he decided that it wasn't six million; it was 109 million. So probably a little different based on his. How would you like to have been the law firm handling that matter? <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> The lawyers representing PHH appealed that. The next step up is over the federal district court. It goes to the federal appellate court. 
And the federal three-judge panel in October of 2016, it was a very scathing opinion to, to the Bureau, to Gordra. Um, they said, you got it wrong on RESPA. It was absolutely wrong. Um, there is a statute of limitations. You can't apply these new theories of law that you made up out of whole cloth that go against 40 years of jurisprudence. You can't apply them retroactively. And oh, by the way, your whole agency, the way it's set up with a single director who can only be removed for cause, it's unconstitutional. That was the ruling. And the Bureau appealed that, asked for a rehearing on bond. It's a fancy French word for let's get everybody together, not just three judges, the whole circuit, all 14 of them. And that case was argued early in the year. The decision came out last week. And what the appellate court said with respect to the constitutionality issue was, listen, we get it. We know this is an uber agency, if you will. He's all powerful. But this was an agency set up by Congress pursuant to a congressional act. And the case law that goes back to the 1930s is not as clear as the three-judge panel. And in the three-judge panel decision, all three judges ruled in favor of PHH on the RESPA issues, the statute of limitations, retroactivity. One judge dissented on the constitutionality issue, and the other two ruled that the Bureau was unconstitutional. That was what was reheard on Bonk. The on Bonk said last week, this is above our pay grade. This constitutional issue, it's an important issue, it's a serious issue, but this is something that needs to be taken up to the Supreme Court. 250 page opinion. They spent most of their time on the constitutional issues. They reviewed it and analyzed it, spent a lot of time, wrote a lot. On the RESPA piece, it wasn't much. So on the RESPA piece, we're not going to revisit that. The, the three judge panel got it right. Uh, we're going to reinstate their ruling on that and remand it to the Bureau for further proceedings. So PHH has to go back to the Bureau. It's like Br'er Rabbit. Oh no, don't send me there. <laughs> What, what's going to happen there? So uh, PHH stopped doing mortgage reinsurance in 2008. And the court said there's a three-year statute of limitations under RESPA, whether you're in court or an administrative law court or a regular court. I'm not good at math, but 2008, that was, that was a long time ago. <laughs> I mean, you're going back to the same guy that just told his enforcement attorneys to dismiss three payday lending to withdraw, to file motions to dismiss. That's where PHH is going back to. Now, do they want to appeal the constitutionality issue to the Supreme Court? I wouldn't think so. I travel back. You can only travel for necessary travel. What's necessary travel? No travel is necessary. <laughs> <laughs> All of this should probably be off the record, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned the uh, payday rule. Uh, the payday rule was withdrawn. He, with the dismissed payday suits, there was a leaked memo, and I use leak for quotes. Boy, that's a thing in D.C. We leak all kinds of stuff. It's a leaky place. <laughs> and he said, basically, no more regulation by enforcement. We're going to look at regulated institutions. The enforcement process is going to be the last resort. We're going to use a more consultative process with our supervised entities. You know, we're going to talk to them. We're going to work through it, which is very much like bank regulation, OCC, the OTS before it. In some cases, the FDIC. They work more with banks, and that, that's what he's saying. I call that memo the banks are people, too, memo. <laughs> I like so, it. Yeah. Um, he received a letter from Elizabeth Warren and Maxine Waters about a detailed letter about the senators wanting information on why he withdrew the payday uh, rule. Um, you know, who, who was in on that meeting? They named the senators specific names. Tell us about these people in your organization that had anything to do with this. Oh, by the way, run a search in your email system for these terms. We want to see it. And my response to that as an editorial comment, as I'm watching this spectator sport, is I can only hope that Mulvaney is as responsive to Elizabeth Warren as Richard Cordray was to Jeb Hensley. I can only hope he's that responsive. So 
bit of an inside joke there. That was funny, by, by the way. That's very funny. Uh, for those of you who follow the, the history of the CFPB. Just um, last week, he stripped uh, enforcement authority out of the Fair Lending Office. So the Bureau had something called CEPL, which somebody I was talking last night, and they said, that sounds like syphilis. I like, oh, no, it's worse. <laughs> Kenny, don't think that, please. <laughs> well, speaking of the CFPB, we've got to move on to HUMDA. Okay. So we've got some HUMDA changes. Uh, we know some of those went into effect last year. Carrie um, from, from QuestSoft is the expert on how this will affect our industry. So I've got a couple questions for Carrie. Uh, does the CFPB Humda platform eliminate the need for a third-party Humda solution? So, no, the, the platform doesn't eliminate the need for a third-party Humda solution. And I was, I was talking with Maureen about this during one of the breaks. I mean, we work with a lot of different loan origination systems for Bruce Vision, obviously, among one of them. And, you know, I always say your LOS can't be all things to all people. We've, for the last 23 years, taken a, a complex process like Humda, which is a lot more complex now, and we've, we've tried to perfect it, and I think we've done a good job. And we work in concert with, you know, the LOS to, to, make, that, to make that a little more palatable. So, you know, what, what our software does, and what we, we've always competed with free software. The, F, the uh, FFIEC always had free software, but if anybody used it, you kind of get what you pay for, right? Um, the fact that you can't aggregate Humda data now easily with the CFPB platform dictates the need for some sort of solution to aggregate your Humda data, scrub it for errors, geocode it, get it ready for submission, review macro edits, review quality edits, make sure you don't have syntactical edits or, or um, validity edits, and, and that's kind of what we do. So, you know, we, just this year, this is the first year of, of submitting to the CFPB, and we have, we've actually sent emails to the CFPB and found flaws in their platform. And they have, to their credit, been responsive and, and fixed a few things. They haven't fixed everything, but there's, there's, still, a lot of, there's still a lot of things that are a little, a little wonky with the submission. And hopefully by next year when we're submitting 120 fields, uh, that will be a little, a little more perfected. Uh, we're not sure, but, but yes, you definitely still need you definitely still need a solution, and you know the solution that we provide in concert with Reverse Vision, I think, is is really a robust combination. Okay. Now, given the changes we've seen at the CFPB, do you see anything that might be repealed or re rolled back at any time soon? Well, I mean, if you would have asked me a month ago, my answer probably would have been different, and, and, and Jim pretty much expounded. I don't think you have to read between the lines to to understand the tumult.